So, hello everyone. My name is Lauren Joswiak. I'm probably unfamiliar to most of you in this moon since I usually stick in the inner part of the solar system. I work primarily on volcanism on the moon and Mercury. And the moon is actually where I'm going to start this journey because it's what led me on this first foray into the outer solar system. So the moon, it's lovely, we're familiar with it. It has a lot of surface volcanic activity. We have the mare here outlined in purple. We have the crypto mare in green. And th there are still mysteries with lunar volcanism, but we know we have a lot of it. We know we have a lot of it on the surface. We know we have a lot of it in the near surface. And we have samples of it, which is great. We know it's basalt. But there's this little niggly question when we try to look at the dynamics of lunar volcanism, and it's the same one that crops up in cryovolcanism. And that's the problem that lunar basalt is denser than lunar anorthosite, in fact. It's significantly denser, and this is the whole outcome of the lunar magma ocean question. So in, in, my, uh, in my journeys, in my working on lunar volcanism, I kept popping up on this question of this negatively buoyant magma, which clearly has not inhibited volcanism on the moon. And so when looking at the outer solar system, I sort of naively tossed my hands up, well, what's the problem? We can do it on the moon. Why should this be a huge problem in uh, inhibiting volcanism on some of the icy satellites? So how, how do we solve this on the moon? As I said, the moon has an extensive volcanic history, both extrusive and uh, near-surface intrusive. Lunar basalt is denser than the North Acidic flotation crust. How can we reconcile this? So one of the things I actually wanted to touch on, because Sarah brought it up yesterday and there's a question on it, is this question of crustal thickness. Can you actually use the variations in crustal thickness as a way to explain uh, uh, volcanism getting to the surface? And uh, Sarah described it pretty well yesterday. If you have a dike that can make it 90% of the way to the surface, if you scrape off that last 10%, do you then get it to the surface? We have a schematic here where we looked at all of the expressions of the surface volcanism and the intrusive volcanism. And you can set a variety of crustal settings for the moon. And it works really well. We have this wonderful phenomenologic model where you can take the lunar crustal thickness as measured by GRAIL or as calculated from grail measurements, and you can predict what type of volcanic features you'll see there, and it matches beautifully. Now, the problem with this is it is a purely phenomenological model. that It is not developed by math, but you can back the math out of it. And the other problem, if we wanted to try to apply this to the icy satellites, is that we don't have the kind of topography, we don't have the kind of crustal thickness measurements for these bodies that we do for the moon. So I didn't want to take this and apply it to the outer solar system because that was just going to be an exercise in futility. So the next question was, well, can we use one of the other new insights from the moon? And that is this idea of actually the lunar magmas are quite volatile rich. And so this is work done by Saul, by Howry, by Rutherford, by Wetzel, discovering all of these rich volatile sources in the rising lunar magma. And the, the theory behind this is really quite simple. The dike tip environment is a natural vacuum. So you're going to set up a pressure gradient within the ascending dike, and this is going to force volatiles to exsolve. Now you have bubbles in your melt. Now you have a less dense melt, and you can get it to the surface. And we do actually see examples of this on the moon. We have here a, a schematic of a little floor fractured crater, which uh, Deborah talked about quite a bit yesterday, but you your ascending dike. It's got a lot of volatiles in the dike. The dike tip, it forms a sill, and you have this, this little, I'll uh, call it a magmatic foam layer at the top, and we can actually see some preservation of this in the GRAIL data for lunar floor fracture craters, where we know there is a large magmatic body beneath the crater, but the gravity signature is not this huge bouquet high like you might expect. It's actually quite moderate and right about what you would expect for the local crustal density, which makes sense because now you've stalled. So the question was, can we use this model? Can we use dike propagation, in particular volatile exolution in dikes? and apply it to the outer solar system and use that to interrogate dike fed crowd volcanism. So what's nice is that it's a natural consequence, and we actually have equations for it. And I actually happen to have a model that I had used for the floor fracture crater problem, where you have a dike propagating through the crust, and you vary the crustal environment. So I thought, well, what can go wrong? I'll just apply this to the outer solar system. You should hear the little warning music in your background right now. So can we use lunar-style dike-fed volcanism as, te as template for cryovolcanism? 
And we want to sort of naively compare the interior structures that we're looking at for this model. And this is, if we were to remember uh, Sarah's talk from yesterday, where she had the whole suite of possible silicon volcanism processes. This is just one tiny one where you have a, a melt body, where you have melt percolating up. It, it impinges on the bottom of the brittle ductal transition. And then it begins to brittle fracture, and it forms dikes that propagate some distance into the crust. And on our icy, our icy satellite, we have an ocean. So we're just going to assume it impinges on the base of the crust. We're not considering any sort of ductal ice where you might have some ascent into a ductal ice, or you might have ductal ice down here, which is stalling it lower. We're assuming just at the base of the ice shelf for simplicity. And these are the equations that we're using in it. So the initial driving pressure is the pressure on the mantle melt reservoir. And we're going to kind of come back to this because it's not actually clear how applicable this model is going to be. But this is where we're going to start, where you have melt accumulating over some vertical region. This would be the melt region in the mantle if we were on a silicate body. And we're going to vary it a little bit because it's not clear what it should be on an icy satellite. So we're going to let this be a free parameter. And then you have our, our dike propagation, our fracture propagation equation here. Where this is the stress intensity of the material you're fracturing, and basically the driving pressure at the tip of the dike, uh, plus the density parameter. And this isn't minus here because we have negatively buoyant magma. So you're, you're in a race against time. You need to see if your driving pressure is greater than the negative buoyancy of the magma, and can you make it to the surface in time. It's really quite exciting to see what happens. So in our model, this, uh, the density of the melt is calculated iteratively as it moves through the crust. And with this, we also vary the crustal density. The crust is not a single uniformly dense slab. We use uh, models actually taken from fern densification. So you assume at the surface about 20% porosity in your ice, and then you compact it down until you hit a, a fully compacted horizon. And then you propagate the dike through that. And again, here, these are the other parameters in here, the vertical extent of melting, density difference between the melt and the mantle. This is going to be important. Density difference between the melt and the surrounding crust, fracture toughness, and then the, the height of the dike tip, how far it can propagate. If we set up our model, again, I wasn't quite sure where I was going to go, so I want to test a lot of different possible things. And it turns out there are a lot of different possible variables for the icy satellites. So ice shell compositions. There are a lot of different ice shell compositions one could use. So for simplicity and for using parameters that I could actually find in the literature, I went with just a pure water ice crust, however in physical that might be, and also a briny crust, so something that trains salts and other bits of our particulate, whatever those particulates might be. A varied cryomagma composition, so a pure H2O water, a briny water, uh, a water plus ammonia mixture. Cryomagma temperature, so this comes into play, again, in our driving pressure term, if we think about these thermally buoyant plumes of cryomagma rising through the ocean, well, what is that temperature difference? Because that temperature difference is going to dictate the density difference between your rising cryomagma plume and the mantle ocean through which it's rising. So we vary that parameter. Ice shell thickness. How thick are these ice shells on these various bodies? It's not clear that we have a, a clear, concise answer. So we varied that parameter as well. And then, of course, the ice shell density profile. As I mentioned, we used one for fern densification. We also used a model where there is an imposed uh, five kilometer mega regolith on top of then a crust which densifies as it goes down. Constants. Thank God we did have a few constants in this model. Gravitational acceleration, all of these uh, models were done for Europa, although you could easily change this for any other body. Ice fracture toughness, uh, we use two different parameters, one for pure ice and one for briny ice, and these are from terrestrial experiments. So they are not done at the temperatures that would necessarily be applicable at the bases or throughout these ice shells, but they're what we have. And then this height of the melt region. In terrestrial situations, this would be pretty much constant. You can measure it through tomography on seismic arrays on the Earth. We can calculate it for things on the moon. But it turns out in this problem, this is actually going to be one of our variables, too, because it's not quite clear 
what we should use. You can scale it as if it were a silicate system, in which case it's going to be proportional to the density difference in your magma and inversely proportional to gravitational acceleration. But those are also variables in here, so we actually end up with a little bit of a range. And again, I said this is going to be a free parameter in our model, which is basically how much driving pressure do you need to get these dikes through the surface. So with this amount of setup, we persisted. I had a very large Excel sheet with all the different models that were going to be tested. And we're just going to look at a small subset of them here, because a lot of questions came out of these models. So the first one we wanted to test was crustal thickness. So this is for a pure water cryomagma moving through a pure water ice shell. And we vary the thickness of this melt region. Again, so really just varying the driving pressure on the dike. And the initial result uh, for a 50 kilometer, 30 kilometer, and 10 kilometer ice shell. And the initial uh, result is the intuitive result, and in that the thicker the ice shell, the larger the driving pressure you need to actually get it up. And to explain these plots just a little bit, because they'll all look like this, we have depth here. So this is where at the bottom of the ice shell you're beginning. Then you have stress intensity here on the y-axis. So you can think of your dike as propagating from the right, moving over to the left. And if it can get to zero before it hits zero on the x-axis, that means you propagate it, and it's terribly exciting. But as you'll see here, we really need quite large driving pressure. So these would be melt regions that are accumulating melt from over a five kilometer column in the, in the mantle. And down here, in all of these cases, to the point where you can't actually see it, this is what our normal scaled melt would be. It's about a two kilometer region. And if you just uh, take the, the, the density proportional inverse to gravity, you get about two kilometer melt region for all of these bodies. And in none of these cases does it even fracture the ice shell down here. The, the dashed line is our fracture toughness. So you don't even get propagation in that case. You need really a very extensive column over which you're accumulating this plume to be able to get anywhere near the surface or even into the crust at all. So again, down there, not even propagating. So temperature. I mentioned temperature is actually very important because this is what drives the initial thermal buoyancy of the plume and gives you some of that driving pressure. So we assume the, the dye appears thermally buoyant. Again, this is just a pure water case for simplicity. And we looked at uh, temperature differences. So between the mantle and the thermally buoyant plume of 25 Kelvin, 50 Kelvin, 75 Kelvin, and 100 Kelvin, because why not? And that's what's plotted down here. We have 100 Kelvin, 75, 50, 25. We got to zoom in to see 25, because 25, again, does not even reach this initial critical threshold to begin propagation. So perhaps the most the most reasonable one is 25 Kelvin. Again, we're failing to get propagation. So something's going on here that we just can't get large enough driving pressures to even begin to fracture the ice shell to make our journey for these dikes. So I was getting a little disheartened at this point. And I wanted to see if I could make it work at all. So are there any cases for which dike propagation is success, uh, successful for reasonable, reasonable H or this reasonable driving pressure? And this is actually a typo and a reason why you should not do slides late at night. So we did get successful propagation, but it's not 0.3 weight percent. It's actually 30 weight percent. So if the interior of Europa were industrial refrigerant, we would be able to get it to the surface. But this is really not a, a reasonable parameter. But we can back it out, and we can look at what the density difference that got us there was. And it's about 100 kilogram per meter cubed, which is not unreasonable if we were to then try to use dike tip propagation. So it suggests that this dike tip degassing could be successful, because this is about the density difference that we're able to get on the moon for these things. Now we will come out fully. We did not actually test dike tip degassing yet, because at this point in time, I've got questions. This was about two weeks ago, and I was feeling a little disheartened, because none of my models were propagating. And I was feeling overwhelmed by the number of variables. And so I thought to myself, well, I can just keep endlessly testing a number of parameters, or I can wait two weeks and interrogate everyone in this room <laughs> as to what we actually think about this model. So I've got questions for you people. <laughs> 
can we actually reasonably initiate dike propagation from an ocean? Is this even a viable model to consider for cryomagmat cryomagmatism really at all or cryovolcanism? As they're pointed out, there are numerous other models that we could pursue in other avenues. So is this model of thermally buoyant plumes impinging on the base of an ice shell actually physically feasible? How thermally buoyant would these plumes be? I have questions about what are the rheological differences? Can you actually get high enough strain rates at the base of the ice shell from these thermally buoyant plumes, given that everything around it is fluid? It's not like you have melt accumulating in a mantle where you have significant stresses because of the rheology and the viscosity. Are there too many variables at present to tackle this problem and get meaningful results? We can make dikes propagate through whatever we want, but are they actually going to be physically meaningful? This is coming off a little bit more cynical than I mean it. I think we actually can get reasonable answers, but it's something that, as a community, I'd really like to get input on. I'd like to really discuss some of the merits of these models. And that's where I'm going to leave it, with questions and discussion for everyone here. So I think I can answer one of those. Um, so uh, Jason Goodman and I a while ago looked at uh, thermally buoyant plumes within the ocean to look at what kind of temperature difference you can support. And it's always a very small fraction of a degree Kelvin that you could actually get a temperature difference uh, okay. at the surface because the ocean mixes so quickly. Okay. Um, but uh, I think maybe it might be more productive to think about this in relation to Linnea's talk of propagating from some source that's maybe within the ice shell, so. Um, I struggle a little bit with the within the ice shell um, because you have to get it there in the first place yeah. and all of these problems come up in the fir first place. But let's just yeah. talk about dike propagation directly from the ocean. If you've got a pressurized ocean and you've got all the tidal stresses, I, I have a suspicion that at least with Enceladus, uh, and we see evidence mm -hmm. of this, that some sort of pr uh, fracture mechanics can work, whether it is dike propagation on its own or coupled with some sort of bottom-down um, uh, tidal stress-induced fracturing. I I'm not completely sure. I really do encourage you to look into the dike tip degassing, though, because this negative oh, buoyancy don't worry, problem, I'm going to all, all of the issues you're having here it seem yeah. to be down to the fact that in almost all cases that I can conceive of at the base of the ice shell, the liquid is more dense than the ice shell. And that has been a problem that cryovolcanism has faced throughout its entire history. Um, the degassing at the dike tip, though, it overcomes it so easily. Yes. You just get this much less dense net, uh, den much lower net density, and you can easily overcome the 8% density contrast. So I really suggest you go that way. Again, it's something that I intend to do, but it, as I was working on this, it became very clear that the dike tip degassing would solve everything once you get it into the ice shell. So this, this initial question of can we actually begin to fracture the ice shell natively, or do we need to invoke a pressurized ocean? Do we need to invoke tidal stressing to pre-fracture the ocean yeah. before we can get the dike to propagate? And for Enceladus, we have some volatile information. Now, you have to make assumptions that the extent to which the, the plumes sump the ocean fairly directly, mm -hmm. but there's a really nice paper by Way to Talon. There are all sorts of uncertainties in the INMS data that give you volatile contents, and at least one of them is saturated ocean pressures. So you've got something very nice yeah. to start off with. Uh, am I going? Oh, OK. Well, I actually think, you know, earlier to Terry's talk and, and what he was just suggesting is that I don't think you need to create the fractures at the dike tip. Mm -hmm. I think you can almost start with a, a fractured ice shell, which might be, a, a, you know, a, a weaker rock to try to fracture. But I actually have more of an issue with the dike tip degassing only because, again, my bias is terrestrial. And so a lot of the places that I have been have been specifically looking at places where dikes have uh, stalled in the subsurface, mm -hmm. so we can see that dike tip. Um, and while we can see multiple pulses of activity, and we can definitely see that there was a you know, vesicular nature to this, these dikes, um, by no means do we start getting anywhere near these high porosities. There's not this volcanic foam at the tips of these basaltic dikes, and certainly not on the orders of meter scales. 
Um, and so again, different rheology, so, but I, I, I recognize that the tipping degassing gets us there. I think you can get your fluid in the fractures. And if you can get the gas, then great, you can get it to the surface. But I don't see this large scale um, collection of volatiles at the tops of, tips of dike tips that have stalled. Jeff? Uh, I want to f uh, follow up and uh, a bit counter what uh, Jeff said about only be a being able to get a, a small fraction of a degree warm plumes. I did a, a tribute poster once in memory of Randy Tufts try trying to uh, merge his uh, passion for caves with his passion for Europa. And uh, I think I managed a pretty good science result, which will be written up after like a dozen years only. Um, but um, I looked, if there are thick, thick, thick bedded salt hydrate deposits on the floor of uh, the, the ocean of Europa, which it's a big question all in itself, but if there are, uh, it should be possible due to the low thermal conductivity of those to develop uh, cavernous uh, dissolution structures that would be, of course, filled with brines and could get really super hot. And it, if those could be emitted in a short period of time, um, and, and there's a I think there's a mechanism to do so. Um, you could get a big burp of really hot brine impinging onto the bottom of the ice shell. Now, is it a toy result? I, I don't know. Um, I really don't know until we see, uh, you know, get a submersible down there or some geophysical means of probing the ocean's thermal and salinity structure. I think a lot of this stuff are sort of toy results in, in a sense, but, um, but I'm not as negative as Steve is about that. I promise I will write this up. <laughs> Steve Vance is going to make me. It was just a quick response. Uh, the zero pressure dike tip only really applies while the, while the dike is moving. And uh, so as long as it's in a molten state, you might expect a fusion and breakdown of the foams straight afterwards. I don't see any strong reason why you would see a, a good record of it preserved in a stalled dike. Although you might see evidence of it when the dike ruptures the surface on Earth with an initial degassing event. Uh, so the lack of evidence in stalled dikes I don't think is necessarily a huge problem. Okay. Um, I was just going to mention the idea of, um, that you can uh, possibly initiate uh, fractures within the ice shell from cooling and thickening. So if you imagine, uh, Nemo did some uh, calculations where you look at a cooling and thickening ice shell, so you get the thermal stresses as well as the volume change stresses that can then um, initiate a fracture that could then propagate to the ocean and open mm -hmm. the pathway possibly for ocean water to come up. Uh, any more questions or discussion over here? For, for a non-initiate in this area, um, it just seemed like the, your two talks about transport up of material through the surface seem remained t disconnected from what Terry was talking about earlier. If you have if you have stresses in the ice shell that are every day squeezing and pushing mush, and so you're basically the transport coefficients for thermal and, and species transport coefficients are not going to be diffusive. They're going to be convective because you're squeezing the liquid through the pores or through the conduits every day. And so it seems like the, with, with at least yours, the, you were talking about rise rates of microns per day or per second. I mean, but the, but the, the, liquid rise is moving up and down perhaps meters on a daily basis. Yeah. yeah, no, that's a good point. I agree. Mine is also a little bit disconnected, and it's it's been hit on with several of these comments. But what I kind of wanted to do with mine is see, can you look at it from, say, purely analog to silicate volcanism, where we don't need to invoke daily tidal stressing of the Earth's crust or of the moon's crust to get dikes to propagate? But it seems like in these icy bodies, if if the body's giving you a fracture, seems you like should. It's gonna help. Yes. Yeah. 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 